This is Rockwell's B-1 bomber. It is one of only four prototypes ever produced. Had it been accepted by the United States Air Force, it would have been the fastest and highest flying bomber ever to go into service. The paradox is that the plane that ultimately did see service, although looking almost identical, flew at half the speed of the B-1, but was much more effective. In many ways, development of the B-1 paralleled development of the very first strategic bomber, the B-17, in that the B-17 also had to deal with an array of problems. The history of the B-17 began when the Army Air Corps circulated a specification for a multi-engine bomber. They probably only expected manufacturers to respond with a twin-engine design, but the Boeing company, showing what was to be characteristic foresight, offered a four-engine plane. As advanced as it may have been, Boeing's Model 299, as the prototype was known, was not very well received. An accidental crash in the early trials and a belief in some quarters that large four-engine planes would be too difficult to fly in combat cost Boeing the initial order. And yet certain factions in the Air Corps encouraged Boeing to continue development of what was, for its time, a massive aircraft. Using much of its own money and fighting government cutbacks, the company continued to develop what was ultimately to be a most important plane. Willed events were to justify this decision. The emergence of the Axis powers caused the Roosevelt administration to rethink its attitude to long-range aerial bombardment, a role in which the B-17 would excel. But the first flying fortresses to see action were 20 examples sent to Britain's Royal Air Force as much for evaluation as for strategic bombing. The British exercise could never be claimed as a major success. Although welcomed by a nation short on armament, the high-flying long-range B-17s, the British called Fortress Ones, were to have a short and checkered career. By flying at 30,000 feet, RAF crews had hoped to evade German fighters. But the high altitude did not deter the Germans, and the limited defensive firepower of the B-17s proved inadequate against the Luftwaffe. With RAF results in hand, Boeing's designers went back to the drawing board. If the plane was to survive, it would have to be rethought. Substantially more armor, which might reduce the plane's bomb load, would have to be added. With a wartime effort underway, women joined the workforce, and production of the B-17, the plane that at one time no one wanted, was considered a strategic priority. Another major modification to the second generation flying fortress was the completely redesigned tail fin, which remedied the stability problems of earlier models. But the major improvement was to defensive firepower. The revised rear fuselage now bristled with gun positions, some in the form of power-operated turrets. An effective but difficult to operate ball turret was a challenge to the courage of any gunner. Bombing by day, B-17s over Europe would continue to suffer heavy losses. It was only the later addition of the escort fighter that radically reduced the toll. Even so, without their added gun positions, flying fortresses would have been easy pickings for the Luftwaffe.
Despite the high cost in lives, there is little doubt that the theory of strategic bombing was well proved, disrupting German industry and slowing down the Nazi war machine. It was an effective but very expensive way of waging war. Throughout the conflict, Germany never had a four-engine equivalent to the B-17. But its scientists did produce a novel and potentially very effective weapon that risked very few German lives and caused considerable panic to its opponents. Powered by an air-breathing pulse jet engine, the V-1 was the forerunner of a new generation of weaponry. Its main achievement was to cause blind panic among civilian populations because with limited guidance, pinpoint targeting was not possible. Although a very clever weapon, the V-1 could be brought down by ground fire and by fast-flying fighters. But there was no defense for Hitler's second vengeance weapon, the V-2 ballistic missile a brilliant and sinister product of the von Braun team which brought the technique of aerial bombardment to a totally new level, one unforeseen by any of the Allies. Meanwhile, American scientists had developed the automated fire control system and had worked to perfect the pressurized fuselage, enabling high-flying bomber crews to operate without the restrictions of earlier planes like the B-17. Their philosophy was to perfect existing technology that could quickly be mass-produced. These innovations, together with many others, came together superbly in the B-29. This was the ultimate development of the conventional piston engine bomber, utilizing America's enormous production capability. But B-29s were never used in Europe. Their principal target was Japan. In the Pacific theater, automated gunnery proved itself a markedly better defense for air crews than anything that had been available to the B-17s. Still, the B-29 was a conventional weapon, in keeping with the American philosophy of perfecting what was known. There was one notable exception, the atomic bomb, the ultimate high-technology weapon of the Second World War. It required only one B-29 to carry such a weapon, and change the course of history. Humanity had lost its innocence. Given the enormous destructive power demonstrated throughout the war by heavy Allied bombers, culminating in the awesome destruction of the atomic blasts, there can be no doubt that by the end of the war, the long-range heavy bomber had become the era's most important weapon, or at least the means of delivering it. Nevertheless, there was also great interest in captured German V weapons. Shipped back to the United States, V-2s in particular were tested by American scientists, although their limited range suggested their usefulness might not be great. But a more serious challenge to the dominance of the long-range bomber was also emerging. Even as early as 1946, the proposed SNARK intercontinental missile offered an extremely useful range of over 5,000 miles. Although not to be operational until the early 50s, this extensive redevelopment of the V-1 concept was to be a major success. 
Still, delivery of atomic weapons in the late 1940s was exclusively assigned to the traditional long-range heavy bomber, and the B-36 assumed the role as the first truly intercontinental bomber. It would protect its enormous bulk by using a large number of gun positions to defend what some consider to be the indefensible. Sometimes referred to as the big stick or the peacemaker, the B-36 used a combination of piston and jet power to extend the American Strategic Air Command's reach to any potential target. In 1947, V-2 rockets originally built in Peenemünde, Germany, were enhanced with an American-made second stage, providing a range which made the Air Force very interested. Interest was increased by the belligerent acts of the Soviets in Berlin and Czechoslovakia the following year. The Soviet Union, an American ally of the Second World War, caused additional concern when in 1949 it demonstrated its own capacity to detonate a nuclear device, initiating one of the deadliest races in history. In the early 1950s, conventional aircraft now with swept wings and fully jet-powered, was still considered to be the most reliable nuclear delivery systems, and therefore the best deterrent against what was fast emerging as the Soviet threat. A distinct cooling in relations between the two superpowers was heightened even further by the conflict in Korea, and the stage was set for a Cold War with nuclear sabers rattling on both sides. Crucial to this game of brinkmanship was the best means of delivery, and as far as conventional aircraft were concerned, the U.S. Air Force had no better vehicle than the first intercontinental all-jet bomber, the famous Boeing B-52. The already considerable range of the B-52 was enhanced by enormous auxiliary fuel tanks, which could be jettisoned after use, giving the aircraft maximum improved aerodynamics. The best means for delivery of atomic weapons, the B-52 was also the logical, if not only choice, for the scientific development of the new and still more lethal hydrogen bomb. Here, at a high security base in the Pacific, technicians install a new generation nuclear device, similar in size to the A-bomb which devastated Hiroshima, but more than 100 times more powerful. Russia gave a great boost to American defense. Right from the onset of the Cold War, American research had borrowed from the achievements of Pina Munda and White Sands. They utilized the nation's largest financial commitment to a single defense system and developed the first arsenal of truly intercontinental ballistic missiles. With the urgency of a war of threats and technology, America's talent for mass production was set to work on a defense system that would totally eclipse the manned bomber program. From this stage on, intercontinental ballistic missiles became the prime means of delivering America's nuclear deterrence. They confronted an equal, if not greater, number of Russian missiles, which combined with other weapons on both sides in a bizarre formula referred to as mutually assured destruction. This arrangement did, however, succeed in maintaining a balance. With so much devastation available, neither side could seriously consider nuclear warfare without ensuring its own extinction. But there was a downside. Missilery was an all-or-nothing option. On the other hand, the manned bomber could be sent towards its enemy in a fine mixture of saber-rattling and brinkmanship.
B-52s stayed in service, equipped with short-range air-launched missiles. They could be released at a safe distance from the target. Some, like the Hound Dog, were supported by a conventional wing and powered by an air-breathing jet, a concept not totally removed from the V-1 technology of Pinamunda. A quantum leap in the evolution of the manned bomber came with the remarkable XB-70 Valkyrie. The B-52 would be a hard act to follow, but North American aviation put forward a submission that was as courageous as it was brilliant. The XB-70 program still stands today as an example of the combination of ingenuity and high technology to achieve otherwise unattainable results. Air Force parameters for the new bomber stated that it should fly three times the speed of sound at extreme altitude, beyond the range of Soviet defense systems. The XB-70 would certainly have secured its own defense through performance, and in spite of the coming dominance of the ICBM, still offered Air Force generals a flexible manned bomber alternative. It was a valuable card in the game of political brinkmanship. But suddenly the program was abandoned. Confidence in very fast high-flying bombers was shattered with one single act. The missile was to be the nemesis of the manned bomber when the Soviets demonstrated the accuracy of ground-to-air anti-aircraft rocketry. Once again, the technology of wartime Germany suggested the next step. The variable sweep wing design had been under development in Germany in the final stages of the war. Later, it had been developed by the American X-Plane program. It took many years of research to perfect the swing wing concept. The first practical use came with the most remarkable aircraft. General Dynamics F-111 proved the theory of the variable swept wing, which allowed the pilot to change configuration from a high-speed delta to a conventional straight wing position for target approaches below enemy radar. Essential to the success of low flying was the development of terrain following radar. This enabled the pilot to select impressively low altitudes to which the F-111 would automatically adjust following the contours of the ground below. But although the F-111 proved the effectiveness of flying undetected under enemy radar, it was not a heavy bomber. Perhaps the same technology could be developed on a larger scale. The Air Force's request for proposal released in 1969 asked, among other things, for low-altitude ride control and nuclear hardness, the ability of the aircraft's electronic system to resist the effects of a nuclear explosion. Again, the North American company took the lead. Now, under its new banner, Rockwell, it put forward a concept that embraced all the latest innovations, including swing-wing technology, but in the proportions of a long-range heavy bomber. To prove the concept, an exhaustive wind tunnel program tested the shape, proportions, and function of Rockwell's proposed swing-wing penetrator. In miniature, every flight characteristic and operational idiosyncrasy of what was to be the B-1 project underwent the closest scrutiny. Throughout the verification process, models were used in many different ways. Here, another scale replica of the B-1, using the same non-radar reflective materials as the final aircraft, is tested. On a movable rig, its ability to hide from radar coming from any angle is thoroughly examined. 
The biggest and most impressive model in this process was the final full-scale mock-up. This faithful representation of the designer's ideas gave the manufacturer and the Air Force the feel of the final aircraft. In those years before computer technology made it unnecessary, the mock-up gave the last opportunity to explore the practicality of the concept before committing to the expense of production. Even details like hinge doors and access panels are faithfully modeled so that ground and flight crews alike can assess almost every physical detail of the finished aircraft. A variety of model weapon loads, both outside the aircraft and inside the bomb bays, look absolutely convincing and provide the closest possible insight to the real thing. So does the layout of the cockpit, and even the swinging mechanism of the wing works just the way it will on the production version. This level of perfection is a test to the model maker, but manufacture of the real thing was to challenge the engineer far more. There had been problems with the early F-111 wing box on which the swing wing pivoted. The B-1B would carry a load many times greater than the F-111, so this facet of its operation was tested in the most punishing way. As always with United States military aircraft, the greatest consideration was placed on the service's most indispensable asset. The preservation of aircrew was a major priority. And with the B-1 project, it would prove a substantial challenge. Rockwell's engineers tackled the problem of crew survivability from a stricken plane in exactly the same way General Dynamics had with the F-111 crew capsule. But for the B-1, with a crew of four, it would have to be much larger and tolerances would be greater. There was always concern about the effects on air crew, not only from the force of ejection, but more importantly, from the impact of landing. The F-111's capsule had worked well, but at this scale, and at a weight of 9,000 pounds, the problems were multiplied. There was a real danger of spinal damage to crews on impact, so rapid action airbags were developed to cushion the effect of the module as it hit the ground. Because of the nature of the B-1's mission, the airbags would have to work on land and water. Meanwhile, at Palmdale, California, construction of three prototypes began. The B-1 project was now underway, even if its long-term future was far from certain. Funding, as in most major defense projects, was to be a continuing problem. Senate criticism of the enormous cost of the B-1 and the usual inter-service competition for the military budget were as difficult for Rockwell executives to handle as the new technology was for Rockwell's engineers. Here, the dedicated test rig is used to assess tolerance to stress to prove the integrity of the B-1's basic design. That integrity would have to be confirmed before any plane with the performance expectations of the B-1 could be allowed to fly in service. Eventually, after years of gestation and months of production, the first B-1 was displayed to the public on October 26, 1974. Its sleek lines were emphasized by its glossy white finish. At the time, it was the largest swing-wing aircraft in the world. The first B-1, serial number 74-0158, rolled down the Palmdale runway on December 23, 1974 for its maiden flight. Originally, plans called for five flying prototypes and two for structural testing, but because of cuts in the program, only three planes were ordered. 
The second and third of these were not to be available for flight testing for over a year. So on the first flight of the first plane, more than usual precautions were taken. Without a ready replacement, loss of this prototype could cause the whole program to collapse. Little surprise then that the first short flight to Edwards should be accomplished with wheels down. Nor was any attempt made to alter the position of the enormous swinging wings. But the two-man crew did adjust the jet exhaust system. This complicated arrangement is sometimes referred to as the turkey feathers for obvious reasons. To control the final stages of up to 30,000 pounds of thrust with full afterburn is a difficult but vital function. Edwards is the traditional base for testing. Once called Murak, this Air Force facility has been the home of many major test programs. Here from the dry Californian desert, the first B-1 with the hopes of Rockwell and the Air Force in the balance would undergo the most thorough flight testing. All the while its detractors looked for the slightest flaw to capitalize on. Already there had been problems with cost overruns. These had been added to by the government decision to produce fewer test planes, substantially increasing the unit cost. Also, the decision to stretch the early delivery schedule created problems with the aircraft's 3,000 subcontractors. Logistics must have been a nightmare. Although the first short flight of the B-1 was a totally successful exercise, its future was still far from secure and much of the real flack the program was to encounter had little to do with the plane's performance. Rather, the arguments were of need, philosophy, and politics. Did the Air Force really require a new bomber? How valuable was a recallable man deterrent? Genuinely informed assessments of whether the B-1 might be able to achieve its mission requirements were less easy to find. And against this backdrop of uncertainty, Engineers and test pilots would have to prove Rockwell's super bomber. As the testing continued, the sole flying example of the B-1 was carefully put through various stages of the test program. Soon, the enormously powerful and complex landing gear was to be retracted and extended. Years earlier, when Rockwell was still called North American, and it was testing the XB-70 Valkyrie on its first prototype mission, the gear failed to retract properly. But the B-1's initial attempt at a clean profile flight was a total success. With something as complicated as the undercarriage, tremendous effort is expended in testing prior to flight. But in the end, the one that really counts is in the air. Throughout 1975, Rockwell's single flying B-1 ran a gauntlet of tests, including the crucial wing sweep function from straight wing to delta shape. There was a comprehensive testing of the four General Electric F-101 fan jet engines and of the delicate task of aerial refueling necessary even for a plane with the B-1's range. It was tested in high-level flight at over 50,000 feet. Then, down to the deck for the all-important below-the-radar barrier trials, flying over 600 miles an hour at less than 200 feet. In these circumstances, the small vanes of the low-altitude flight control system were vital. 
Government cuts to the program meant that only three prototypes were to be built. The first of these was to fly, and the second was for structural testing. At the end of 1975, the stress tests were complete, and the aircraft was released to be fitted out for flying. But it would not be available till May of the following year. In January of 1976, the third aircraft, built for flight testing, came online. This aircraft would concentrate on much of the complex avionics equipment used in the B-1 program, especially the Boeing-built offensive electronic system, a vital part in the B-1 mission. Inside the cockpit of these prototypes, a complicated array of dials and meters surrounds the cathode ray tubes. If you look closely, you can see the fighter-like control columns, unusual in a large aircraft. Directly behind the pilot and co-pilot, the other two crew members sit in their positions. The defensive and offensive systems operations use the high point of radar development not only to identify and target the enemy, but also to fend off attacking opposition fighters. It's a far cry from the air gunner huddled in the rear of the B-17. The B-1 crew fly in comfort, but in combat they'd face the same old risks, fighting off late 20th or 21st century bandits. As the testing of the first three aircraft continued, with the speed and altitude envelope being constantly pushed, a fourth plane, authorized for August 1976 production, started its early stages of construction. With this latest B-1 underway, it seemed the program had gained sufficient momentum to survive its critics. With so much research behind it, and so many of the problems solved, it appeared certain the Rockwell bomber would continue into production. But then, on June 30th, 1977, the recently elected Carter administration cancelled the project and the B-1 program came to a halt. A unit cost of over $100 million was not the least of the reasons for cancellation, but there were others. One influential factor was the earlier successful testing of a unique combination of two proven pieces of American hardware, a Minuteman missile and a C-5 transport aircraft. If it could be demonstrated that the C-5 was capable of launching the missile in flight, then it could offer the Air Force an extremely cost-effective form of recallable deterrent. The survivability of a massive transport aircraft as it approached the combat zone may not have been great, but the extra range offered by the missile may have combined to produce some form of deterrent if the experiment worked. Although it was not to be adopted as a complete system, the air launching of an ICBM was nevertheless a spectacular achievement. It may yet have some potential. A much more concrete threat to the B-1 came in the form of the air-launched cruise missile, or ALCM. These are clever and extremely deadly weapons. Before extension, their wings and tailplane fold flush to the main body, so that many such missiles can be carried under the wings or in the internal bomb bays of a B-52. The ALCM program, which was quickly implemented by the Carter administration, gave the aging B-52s a new lease on life as a suitable delivery system. The cruise missile uses small air-breathing jet engines and with their extended wings and subsonic speed obviously owe something to the original cruise missile, the German V-1 of World War II. But 30 years of technical evolution enabled the addition of concepts similar to the terrain-following radar first used in the F-111. This produced a weapon that was at the same time economical and effective 
and considerably extended the range and survivability of the B-52. One thing was certain after the Carter decision to cancel the B-1. The B-52, old as it was, would have to carry on as America's only long-range recallable deterrent. But although more life could be squeezed out of these remarkable aircraft, it was equally obvious that in the long term, a new delivery platform of some kind was inevitable. Even with the support of dedicated bomber versions of the F-111 and the ALCMs, the hitting power of America's strategic air force was starting to wane. In spite of the discussed conversion of transport aircraft to carry cruise missiles, it had been known for many years that survivability over or even close to enemy airspace required specialized aircraft, and a missile-carrying transport would be limited to a type of delivery far less challenging than the Air Force would expect from a B-52 replacement. Clearly, a long-range penetrator was needed. Although the Carter decision had cancelled production of the B-1, it had allowed some funds for the continued tests of the first three planes and to complete the building of the fourth. It was with these four aircraft that Rockwell started to resurrect the program. But much time had passed since the cancellation, and if the swing-wing bomber was ever to reach production, it would be vastly different from the original concept. In some ways, time had worked in the plane's favor. New ideas were now becoming available, and with flying test vehicles on hand, their qualities could be quickly verified. The most important change to strategic thinking was the revised attitude toward high speed. The first parameter for the B-1 had been that it could fly at over 50,000 feet and speeds in excess of Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. And then, as it approached enemy radar, the plane was expected to drop to 200 feet and high subsonic speed to make its final run undetected. But later thinking claimed that Mach 2 speed performance was of no real strategic value. Low and slow, if 600 plus miles an hour is slow, was seen as the best way for a long-range penetrator to reach its target. The reduction in top-end speed requirement would enable other benefits to be included in the new plane and would also contain costs. Much greater emphasis was placed on making the plane invisible by using non-radar reflecting materials. The new bomber would appear to be less than 1% of the size of a B-52 on enemy radar screens. In-flight refueling for optimum range was given even greater priority, as there had been unfounded criticism of the early plane's results at low level. A major change was implemented for crew survival by deleting the crew ejection module, which had never been perfected, in favor of conventional ejection seats, quite suitable for the slower flying version. With revised specifications from Rockwell, and the pressing need to solve the B-52 replacement problem. The Reagan administration announced in October of 1981 the decision to build 100 Rockwell bombers to be called the B-1B. The four earlier prototypes, which had done so much valuable work to prove the basic and later the modified concepts, would continue in the test program as the B-1A. It is entirely possible that had these four original aircraft not been available, the entire B-1B, the born-again bomber project, would never have got underway.
the B-1B was to have many new features, including a modified and vastly improved Bombay. These cavernous areas can now be adjusted to accommodate different weapons loads and fuel requirements. Clearly, given the success the cruise missile had enjoyed, it would also have to be accommodated. Because the B-1B would be the B-52's replacement, the new aircraft would have to accommodate conventional and atomic devices in a variety of sizes and configurations to fulfill a range of operations. Given this need for flexibility and the far-reaching scope of the B-1 project, it's hard to imagine that serious consideration was not so long ago given to using transports like the C-5 to carry cruise missiles, and that this combination was supposed to replace the classic B-52. As the B-1A continued to prove the new performance specifications, work on the B-1Bs was well underway at Palmdale. The total cost of 100 B-1Bs was to be $20 billion, or over $200 million a plane. But with the lesson learned from the disruption of the earlier program, at least the B model was certain of completion, and this meant, in the long term, the best value for the money. Much of the B-1B's cost goes to provide its sophisticated avionics equipment. Fixed antennas and radar dishes literally project from every angle of the fuselage, all gathering information for its computers to analyze. From this data, the crew will make decisions, decisions that may well resolve the outcome of a mission with historic importance, and the fate of the aircraft and those that fly it could equally be at stake. All things considered, perhaps the Rockwell Swing Wing bomber is not so expensive after all. Many types of skills and technology are employed as the tens of thousands of parts come together and the giant technological jigsaw puzzle that is the making of a modern bomber starts to take shape. By the middle of 1983, the first B-1B production model was ready to make its public debut looking so very much like its predecessor. The new planes are hard to distinguish from those which first appeared almost a decade earlier. Modified air intakes and a small window for the radar operators are subtle but effective clues for the untrained eye. However, the performance variations are not subtle. The B-1B, flying with half the speed potential of the A model, uses 21st century materials to become almost invisible to enemy fighters and missiles and therefore is far more likely to complete its mission. And all the time it's on its deadly journey, it's providing tacticians with the flexible option of a last minute recall, a role only the manned bomber can perform, but a role that was often understated in the past. Having survived against competition that started with such crude weapons as the V-1 flying bomb, and later evolved into the sophisticated and extremely deadly cruise missiles that would be carried by aging B-52s, and having been eclipsed by the development of ballistic missiles, which began with the German V-2 rockets, and over time, developed into the powerful intercontinental ballistic missiles that completely dominated the topic of nuclear delivery for over 30 years. The manned bomber survived by using yet another German innovation, that of the variable swept wing. In the early 60s, the idea, greatly refined and used in conjunction with terrain-following radar, emerged as the F-111, 
very successful medium strike bomber. And in the early 70s, the concept was further developed into the B-1, the ultimate high-speed, long-range manned bomber. But it was to take another 10 years, and the arrival of still more advanced construction materials and another generation of avionics before the later model, the B-1B, was to reach service. A masterpiece of high technology, the best that the aerospace industry could offer, had finally arrived. It will fly well into the 21st century, and given time will doubtless become a similar legend to the aircraft it replaced, the B-52. But clearly, the B-1B, the born-again bomber, is already one of the world's great planes. <laughs>